Well, good evening and Merry Christmas to you. And I want to welcome everybody online, and we're honored to have you. We always say here at Community of Hope, we know that uh, this is a really important weekend for really all of us, and the idea that you have uh, decided to come and worship, and then that you have decided to come and worship here is not lost on us, and we're honored to have you. I was thinking about a passage of Scripture uh, to read to you tonight to have us reflect on, and I want you to know as a pastor, as a communicator, that's not necessarily an easy decision. I want to explain. First of all, I know why you're here. You're here because it's Christmas Eve and you want to hear the Christmas story, which um, I know that the pressure is on me to deliver the goods, right? I got I to gotta deliver. And then secondly, what I would want you to know, there's not a lot of stories in the Bible or, or moments in the Bible that tell the story of Jesus' birth. In fact, in my own county, I can only count two. Um, two gospels tell a version from their perspective of the birth of Jesus. One gospel, the gospel of Mark, excludes it altogether. It starts a little later. The gospel of John, if we are really to understand it, it's not so much really a telling of the Christmas story as it is a, a telling of the prequel of the Christmas story. There's not a lot of passages in the Bible that relate to the Christmas of sto uh, story in some way. And then lastly, this is year 27 for me to tell the story here. And so the, the, the pressure is real. And some of you have been to a lot of my messages and you might want to say to me, yeah, the pressure is real. And uh, so I was thinking about this and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go old school. And I want to read to you a passage of scripture that tells the story of Christmas, the story of Jesus' birth. And it's probably the one, I think, arguably, that we would remember most. And in fact, if you have any Christian memory at all, if you have any sort of religious memory of the past, this would be the story that you remember. And there's even a particular reason why you may remember it. And I'm curious if anybody would, would, would know why you would know Luke's version of the gospel uh, telling of the Christmas story that more than any other. Any, anybody have an idea? It's the one that Charlie Brown told, right? It's the one that Linus read. And here's what I want you to know, because I love you and because I care for you and I want to deliver the goods. I'm going to read the story to you the same version that Linus read to Charlie Brown, which is the authorized King James Version of the Bible, which we all know is the, is the version of the Bible Jesus read from. Come on, y'all. I worked really hard to work that into my message. Would you stand? And we're going to read God's word together. And we're going to read from Luke chapter 2. So here it is in the authorized King James Version. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, good will toward men. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you for that. Let's pray together. You know, Lord, I'm gonna ask uh, in this space and in this time, that uh, this would be a moment, these moments together around your word, that God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, they would become something more for us than just religious tradition or family tradition. And I believe with all my heart, Lord, that all of us are here and gosh, we need a word from you. 
in this season of our lives. And I pray that, Lord, you would offer it through this understanding of your precious word. For we pray together in Jesus' name and everybody said amen. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have seen a Charlie Brown Christmas? Show me hands, throw them up high, let me see. Yeah, this aired first in 1965, which means I was three years old when it first aired. And uh, uh, I have so many memories of this story. Uh, and in fact, I want to tell you how it would go down in my house. First of all, this is what would happen. Uh, we would get a paper. Now, I don't know if you don't know what a paper is. It's this thing. <laughs> and like it, it magically appears in the driveway. And my dad would send one of my brothers or myself out to drag it back into the house. And tucked into the Sunday version of, of the local paper was this thing called the TV Guide. Now, I've lost many of you in the room right now. And uh, my mom would open up the TV guide and she would locate, she would search, and she would locate till she found a Charlie Brown Christmas. She would circle it, she'd put it in her calendar. And then on the night the show was to appear, she would have my brothers and myself, these were the rules. We had to come in early, we had to take our baths, we had to put on our pajamas, we had to brush our teeth. And now having raised two girls of my own, I know it was just a clever ploy to get us in and out of the bathtub and you know, get, our, get our teeth uh, brushed. But we would watch the show. And uh, what I remember about it is that this show, would we would watch it every year. And every year for 58 years, this show has had a, a run that has shown up on television free and clear on public television every year for 58 years except this year. And I don't know if you know it or not, but Apple bought the rights to a Charlie Brown Christmas and they decided to show it only twice, which was December 15th and 16th. You could watch it for free any other time other than that. $9.99 a month will get you the deal. And just another idea where big tech is ruining everything, right? That was funny too at, at the other service. But uh, anyhow, so, um, you know, when I think about uh, this, this idea that this was this free run for you know, uh, 58 years, the show centers around this idea. Here's the idea. Charlie Brown's quest to understand the deeper meaning of Christmas. And I thought, you know, because now that Apple's bought it, maybe you haven't seen it this year, I thought I would do a favor. And um, so I reached out to Charlie <laughs> and I, I borrowed his tree and I want you to notice, there we are, we have some lights on the tree, and then we can plug the lights in. And hold on just, just a moment. We have another little thing we're gonna put on up here. And we're gonna dress this around like this. And voila, Charlie Brown Christmas tree, everybody. And like I said, this, this, the whole idea behind the show is that you and I might uh, have an opportunity, Charlie's quest, we enter into Charlie's quest to understand the deeper meanings of Christmas. And I started thinking to myself, that's why we're here. Uh, that's why uh, we're in this moment together. And uh, when we think about Christmas and we think about beyond, you know, the celebrations and the family and the eating and the meals and the gifts and the lights, what we all need is a word. And we need a word that helps us understand the deeper meanings of Christmas. I mean, this is a time when we celebrate that Jesus has come to earth. And here's the question. Since he has come to earth, what is it that he wants to say to us in this space? And here's what I think. I think if there was ever a year we needed to hear a particular word, it's this year. And the particular word I think that we should really focus on happens in the three verses toward the end of what we just read a moment ago. I want to show it to you. It's actually Luke chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. And this is at the very heart of what Linus reads, you know, to Charlie Brown. And he says, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, here it is, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 
And here's what I want you to know. What I find so personally compelling about these words, these three verses, and what is such a joy for me to be able to tell you as a Christian pastor is that these words, fear not, and say it with me, fear not. Say it again, fear Say it like you mean it, fear not. These words, fear not, are the most often uttered command in all of the Bible. If you're a Bible nerd in the room tonight, which I'm a Bible nerd, uh, I count over 125 times in Holy Scripture where God in some way through an angel, God some way through a prophet, God some way through just saying these words himself would say to all of those who would listen, fear not. And I have to tell you, I, I think if there was ever a word that so many of us need to hear in our lives around a particular circumstance, a particular situation somewhere, this is the word. Now, I want to tell you that I, what I find so interesting, too, and, and what's such a joy for me to be able to say is that it's, it, it ought to be freeing to every one of us in this room and everyone online to know that God's um, most often uttered command is fear not, it's not... Um, straighten up. Aren't you glad to know that's not, I, I had a teacher when I was growing up and I know you think I'm practically perfect in every way, but I have to tell you that um, I had a teacher uh, that, you know, uh, did not think that. And every now and again, she would say this to me and she would add a line to it. She would say, Hey, Dale. Yes, ma'am. She goes, straighten up. And what do you think she'd say after that? Straighten up and fly right. Yeah. You had the same teacher I did. Okay. Um, and isn't it good to know that that's not God's most often uttered command? Straighten up. Uh, isn't it good to know that God's most often uttered command uh, isn't um, try harder? Try harder. Earlier this year, I, I met with a guy in our church who was coming to our church. He's kind of new to church. And uh, I greet after the services. You'll see me out there in the lobby, and I love to talk to people. And he came up and he said, "Hey, could I have? Could we grab a cup of coffee sometime?" I said, "I would love to have a cup of coffee." And he worked it out. We got uh, our schedules connected, and 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 uh, I was talking to him and met at a local coffee shop, and and I said, "Tell me your faith journey." And he said, well, my, you know, he said, I, I went to church. He goes, I was forced to go to church when I was young. And he said, when I, I got up, and this is the way he said it. He said, I graduated from church. And uh, he said, to be honest, I said, really, tell me more about that. And he said, well, I got tired trying to please a God that can't be pleased. And uh, he said that in a way almost as kind of a, to push at me a little bit. And I told him, I said, gosh, that's got to be hard. He said, it was awful. And I said, yeah. I said, but I would want you to know, I don't know what God that is. But that's not the God of the Bible and that's not the God that I serve. And some of us are here tonight. We know what it's like to just kind of get on a religious treadmill, you know, and just try to dutifully just stay in line all the time. And God's greatest command, his most often uttered command is not straighten up. It's not try harder. It's not even, hey, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. It's not that. It's, it's fear not. And I just wonder tonight how many of us in some form or fashion, somewhere in our lives, right, we need to hear God's word uttered to us. Fear not. Uh, in some ways, um, here's what I would tell you. This has been a year for fear. Uh, the year began. Uh, globally, we were watching this ongoing struggle in Ukraine. I read an article just earlier this week, this very week, and there, uh, there was a quote in the article by Vladimir Putin who said, I'm going to finish what I started, whatever that means. We've watched a, a war erupt now between Israel and the Hamas, and we've seen innocent Israelites and we've seen innocent Palestinians murdered and displaced. It's fearful. As a pastor, I've been involved with people across this past year in some 
horrible circumstances. Uh, addictions that have popped out and come to the surface. Family tensions that have just divided one member and one side of the family from another. Bad medical diagnoses. Um, surprising and horrifying losses and deaths out of nowhere. Precious people in this room. So there's a reason for fear. And what I want everybody to know tonight, I think the kind of fear that the angel was speaking about that happens 125 times in Holy Scripture is not the kind of fear that we're all wired with, you know, that, that those who study neuroscience, in fact, they, they say this kind of thing to us. They say that there is a healthy fear that is a self-correcting mechanism that creates a sensation just unpleasant enough to motivate us to take action, to distance ourselves from what it is that threatens us. I don't think that's the fear the angel was talking about. And I don't think the fear the angel was talking about are these irrational fears sometimes that we have. I remember reading a quote many years ago by a guy uh, from a guy by the name of Dave Barry who wrote for the Miami Herald. That's a newspaper also, by the way. And Dave Barry writes this idea and he says this. He goes, all of us, he said, all of us are born with this kind of instinctive fears. And there are these fears, he said, that are uh, the fears of falling, fear of the dark, fear of lobsters, feeling uh, the fear of falling onto lobsters in the dark. <laughs> and the fear, especially this time of year, the dreaded word, some assembly required. <laughs> That's not what I think the angel was pushing at. The angel was pushing at the kind of fear that you and I can have that makes our circumstances huge. And our God, small. That's the kind of fear. I want to show you a picture of a guy that I greatly respect. I've read a lot of his stuff. His name is C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis, it's a picture of him early in his uh, transformation as a follower of Christ. And C.S. Lewis tells this incredible story that uh, near the end of his life, he's talking about fear. And he makes this observation. He says this. He said, there are some fears that, um, he said, are, are almost seem to have developed a particular kind of will around them. Almost as though they're a force, there is a force behind them, as though they have been created and thrust upon us. And the end result, the end desire of those fears is the destruction of our faith and the destruction of genuine belief altogether. Now, I don't know if you're ready to believe that or not, but nor toward the end of that quote, this is the observation that he says. He said, I've come to believe that there is actually no neutral ground in the universe, that every square inch and every single second is either claimed by God or counterclaimed by Satan. And I don't know about you, but I've just seen some stuff this year. I've had some battles in my own Life, I, was, I got involved earlier this year. I was asked to leverage my leadership into this other sphere outside of Community of Hope, but no involvement with our church whatsoever. Uh, but they said, hey, we would, we would appreciate it if you would help us out in this scenario. And it just devolved. I was part of this group that just devolved into this contentious, conflictual thing in an organization across the year that was demoralizing and depressing to me. And sometimes it felt like it just had a will of its own. That's the kind of fear that the angel is pushing against. This kind of fear where our circumstances just overwhelm us and our God seems to disappear. Well, here's what I want to tell you all tonight. My goal isn't to offer to you like a platitude that I would just have, let's all just recite and say, fear not, and, and we go back out into our circumstances that are overwhelming. In fact, what I really want to do is I want to offer you an opportunity to lean in and learn how to actualize the command that God gives us. After all, right, it's a command. And he didn't offer the command as a way to invite us into something that's unattainable. He gives us an opportunity to step into it. And so the question is, 
Okay, Pastor Dale, how do we step into it? I have a suggestion. First of all, we could um, do what the shepherds did. And I want to show, show you what the shepherds did. It happens in verse 15. The shepherds discovered for themselves, look at what it says here. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And one of the translations in the Bible around what is happening right here is that it's this idea where the, where the, where the uh, shepherds were saying this, let's go see for ourselves. And here's what I want to tell you. That's what you have to do. You can't borrow somebody else's faith when your life gets hard. You can't even pray somebody else's prayers when life gets difficult. You have to pray your own. And one of the things that I always think about as a pastor, I just want to name in this room, there's such incredibly rich nostalgia about what we're doing right now. But here's what I want to remind everybody and gently just push at just a little bit. The Christian faith is much more than nostalgia. It's more than that. And the other thing that I think we could do, quite honestly, well, we could, um, we could do what Mary did. And you know what Mary did? Mary treasured and pondered. And if you look at this powerful that verse of Scripture, verse 19, notice what it says here. But Mary, all these things are going on, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. You know what I was thinking about earlier this month? What is it that, that made Mary Mary? You ever thought about that? Uh, there's a lot of ideas right now that float around in our culture. And, and frankly, I want to be clear, not all those ideas are biblical. Uh, there's an idea that Mary was perfect. Well, here's the thing. Scripture never said she was perfect. But she did ponder and treasure. She opened her life to the mysteries and the wonders of the living God. That's what made Mary, Mary. This past year, I was having a difficult, uh, in that difficult trial I was involved in all year long. There was a moment where a friend of mine sent me a powerful worship song that I would play often in my truck when I was driving around. And there's a, there's a line in the song that says this, shake up the ground of all my tradition, Lord. Break down the walls of all my religion because your way is better. And then there's another line that reminds me of Mary. And the line in the chorus of the song says, I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. When you learn in your life to make room for Jesus Christ, he shows up in your life in powerful ways that you could never script. It's not just about a religious moment. It's about inviting him in, trusting in his promises. And when you do that, here's what happens. Your circumstances well, they start to right size and your God, the God of the Bible, begins to grow. How do we, how do we appropriate fear not? Well, you gotta, you gotta be like the shepherds. You gotta discover for yourself. You, you gotta be like Mary. You gotta think about it. You gotta ponder it. You gotta treasure it. Got to welcome, welcome it in. And I was thinking, you know, if that doesn't work, I could say one other thing. <laughs> you could do what Linus did. You could do what Linus did. I, I was thinking about Linus' story, and I don't know if you remember, in Charlie Brown Christmas, he always had, what is this? Blanket. It's his blanket. He was never, ever without his blanket. This was like his security blanket. But there's a moment when Charlie Brown says, hey, Linus, what is the meaning of Christmas? And Linus goes, here's what happens. If you remember, he takes the blanket out 
And then he goes, Charlie, I'll tell you the meaning of Christmas. And he goes, lights, please. (laughs) We worked on that all week long. Come on. (laughs) And he steps to the center of the stage. And he's holding a security blanket. And he says, and lo, and lo. The angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not. Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of a great joy which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David is born unto you a child which is Christ the Lord. And the single and only time ever Linus dropped the blanket was when he said, fear not. And it kind of makes me wonder, what do you have to drop? What unforgiveness, past hurt, addiction, anger, grief and loss, the loss of hope. All month long, we've been lighting candles as a way to remember all the promises of God, like hope, love, joy, and peace. And they're all found in the life and witness of Jesus. And so tonight, right, when we light the Christ candle, it's a reminder to every single one of us these immortal words. Fear not. God, I pray over everyone listening to my voice online, in overflow, in this room, that we might have the courage of Linus, that we might have the curiosity of the shepherds, that we might have the devotion and attention of Mary, that we would be able, God, to get past whatever it is right now that's just holding us, and that we might be able to right size so that our circumstances are smaller and our God, you, God, become bigger. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the scriptures boldly proclaim to us that the people who have been living in darkness have seen a great light. And on those who live in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And for in Christ himself was this life, and this life is the light of all humankind. This is the light that is now shown in the darkness, and the darkness has not, nor will it ever overcome it. And so as you leave this place and as you extinguish your candles here, will you resolve to go in the light of Christ, to live in his light, to live in his grace, to live in his forgiveness, to live in his hope, and resolve deeply in your heart to be a light in the darkness everywhere you go. And that you would do this so that all may see you, may see him. And all who see him may know him. And all who know him may come to worship him. This Jesus, the light of the world. Amen and amen. Merry Christmas.